Um, so this week and next week, we're going to learn neural, how to do um, neural networks for function approximation, for regression, for classification, um, and even for other tasks, uh, time permitting. Um, in, in order to understand neural networks, um, you need to understand a few things first. You need to understand optimization. And I think the microphone isn't working. Let me just. So you need to understand optimization. And then the other thing that you need to know is logistic regression, which is essentially a neural network with one neuron, one node. If you understand one node and you understand optimization, then the rest is just putting those two ingredients together and our knowledge of probability and we will be able to do, you know, be able to deal with any type of data uh, whenever we're doing classification or regression. Um, so today we're going to look at optimization. Friday we're going to look at one neuron logistic regression, which by the way is a very popular classifier. Um, in fact, I read an article where um, Khan's Academy, when they try to learn from students in order to provide feedback, they actually are using uh, logistic regression, which is a neural network of one neuron. Um, and I believe most companies out there, companies like Twitter and so on, also use uh, logistic uh, regression as one of their basic algorithms. And then when we combine many logistics regressions together, we will get something called a multi-layer perceptor, or as often it's called these days for particular applications, autoencoders. Okay, so let's start with optimization. Optimization builds on calculus. Um, the basic um, idea is the following. When we take the frequentist approach to learning, we do maximum likelihood. Uh, we often take an objective function, the log likelihood, we differentiate it and equate it to zero. And, and that gives us uh, the, the, the estimates. Now, in everything we've done up to now, except for the lasso, when we equate it to zero and solve for theta, we were able to get an answer for theta, like rich was x transpose x plus delta square i x transpose y. So we were always able to get a close form solution. Um, we saw with the last suit that it was not possible anymore to get a closed form solution. And for, in fact, for most problems, it's not possible to get closed form solutions just by differentiating an equation to zero. So we need to rely on, in order to find a place where the derivative becomes flat, that is, in order to find the minimum of the error function or the maximum of the probability, the two problems are equivalent. Um, in order to find a place where the derivative becomes flat, we're going to follow the derivatives. Okay? Just like if you happen to be on top of Grouse Mountain and you want to get to the point where it's flat, you basically start descending. And you keep descending until, until you get to a point where if you were to go in any possible direction, you would not be able to descend anymore. At that stage, you found the minimum. Okay? So that's the basic idea of how um, all the learning algorithms based on optimization work. On the other hand, the Bayesian algorithms are based on conjugate analysis. Uh, we saw how to do that for the Gaussian model. We just did it last week for the Dirichlet multinomial model. But Bayesian analysis, when we try to do it for more complex models, turns out to, be, to require us to solve integrals, uh, high dimensional integrals. And that turns out to be an extremely, extremely hard problem. Uh, we even have a complexity class for uh, this class of hard problems, sharp P. Um, with, with the Bayesian methods, we have to develop um, ways of solving integrals in high dimensions. And so there are different things out there. There's things called variational methods. Um, there's techniques called Monte Carlo. Um, those will not be part of this course because unfortunately we do not have enough days and so on to cover that. But they, those techniques are part of uh, 540. So those of you wanting to carry on um, encountering those techniques will meet me here in January where we'll continue. For now we will focus on the frequentist techniques, the optimization techniques. Um, uh, they're 
there are the techniques that places like Google, for example, is uh, working wi with right now because they have possibly millions of parameters and so they need to be frequentist for pragmatic reasons. Okay. So today I'm going to define, we've already sort of in, been introduced to this, but I'm going to make the definition very precise of what I mean by a gradient. What I mean by a Hessian, a Hessian is just going to be the second derivatives, but when you have more variables. Um, and then we're going to discuss three algorithms, gradient ascent, following the gradient immediately, also known as steepest ascent, Newton's method, which not only uses the, the gradient, but also looks at the curvature um, of the error function that we're minimizing. We will look at stochastic gradient ascent, which is what you need when the data, when you don't get to see all the data, but when the data comes to you one at a time. Um, online learning for ex is very useful for applications such as Twitter, for example, because the data keeps coming at you one at a time. And you're in a streaming environment. Um, and finally, um, all these techniques will be applicable to neural nets, but today we will apply them to the linear model. Because if they fail in the linear model, we, we, we need to question the value, their value. But as we will see, when we apply these techniques to the linear model, they will still be able to find essentially the least square solution. Okay, the gradient. Um, as we've seen up to now, we always talk about a, an objective function or a log likelihood which is an objective function as well. And the objective is to find a set of thetas, a multivariate vector of thetas, um, that allow us to uh, find a solution. For example, when we do uh, when we deal with quadratic problems, let me scratch these. When we deal with quadratic problems, we have an intercept and a slope. And what we're trying to do is trying to find uh, the minimum of a function, or in this case, if you take minus the function, finding the maximum. If we have a function, a quadratic function here, f of theta naught and theta one, a function of two variables like this ball, then the gradient in this case, these arrows here, these blue arrows, the gradient evaluated at a particular theta, say theta star, is just a derivative of f of theta with respect to theta naught and then the derivative of f of theta with respect to theta one. So we take, we have a function of two variables. For example, we might have that f of theta naught and theta one is equal to minus sum from i equal one to n of yi minus xi theta squared where theta is a vector with components theta naught and theta one. Okay, so if we're fitting a line to points, we have two parameters, the slope <coughs> theta one and the intercept theta naught. And our objective then is to find the theta naught and the theta one that goes through the points. In that case, we know we're dealing with a quadratic and our, essentially the place where the slope becomes zero, which is here at the top, is the optimal solution that we're looking for. Okay, so this still, we're still dealing here with the regression um, problem. The gradient is just a derivative or with respect to each of the parameters. Okay. And evaluated at theta equal theta naught. Okay. Um, the purpose why 
the reason why I'm spending time here is to try to say that the gradient is a vector. It has two components. And also that the gradient is a function of theta. Um, the, you get a blue vector everywhere. So you can evaluate the gradient at any point. The gradient is a function of theta naught and theta one. Okay, so um, as we go to more variables, we, we just define the gradient as being the derivative with respect to each of the variables. Okay. I'm looking at blank faces. Let me get a show of hands. How many people feel comfortable with this? How many people would like an example now in more detail? Okay. I'm going to come to the board. Um, Bob, would you mind zooming in when I write on the board? Thank you. Um, so let's look at an example where we have f of theta. So let's go back to linear regression. Okay, this is a problem we all understand well now. We have several points, and our goal is to fit a line to those points. And this line has a slope, and it has an intercept. Sure. Okay, by now I expect everyone to know this. Right? The equation of a line. The objective function that we're solving there is the sum over all the data of yi minus xi transpose theta that's the equation of the line, or in this case, if I'm going to write it component-wise, would be theta naught and theta one xi. Okay, square. <coughs> That's the objective that I minimize in the least squares. Now, this is very important to know. If I have a function f of theta like this, then the function minus f of theta is just a mirror image of that function. Negating a function just flips it. So maximizing a positive function is the same as minimizing a negative function. If you flip the sign, we change optimization for maximization for minimization. And in fact, I often don't even talk about maximization and minimization. I just talk about optimization because it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the way of finding where the slope is zero and where the slope is zero in both of these plots is the same. Okay, so that is my f, that's what I mean by an f of theta. There is an objective that I'm trying to minimize. In this case, only because I gave you a drawing, the only drawing I could find was one where the function was in fact like this as opposed to like this we're maximizing instead of minimizing, so I'm going to put a negative here to indicate that we're maximizing. That's why I put a negative um, up there. And so if this is my f of theta, and here by theta I mean the vector theta, which has two components, theta naught and theta one. And then my gradient, so this is f of theta naught and theta one, if you will, component wise. And so my gradient of f of theta naught and theta one is just a vector that has the derivative of f of theta naught and theta one <coughs> with respect to theta naught, and then the derivative of f of theta naught and theta one with respect to theta one. So it's the derivatives with respect to each of the parameters of the model. If I had more parameters, then I would have had more derivatives migrating back. Okay, and then the rest is, well, you know how to compute derivatives. We'll do, we'll do these later throughout the class. But you essentially you just need to compute the derivative of this function with respect to theta naught. You plug it in here as the first component. 
and the derivative with respect to theta 1 and you plug it in here. And that's the gradient. It's a vector. Of course, the gradient is a vector of theta naught and theta is, is a function of theta naught and theta 1. If I try different values of theta naught and theta 1, I'm going to get a different vector. Okay? So because you, you have to evaluate it. Um, you get to evaluate these derivatives at each value of theta naught and theta 1. Or to make it more precise, we might as well just finish this exercise. And this would be minus the sum from i equal 1 to n of 2 yi minus theta naught minus theta 1 xi times minus 1. And then the next one would be minus the sum from i equal 1 to n. So if one takes the derivatives, applying the chain rule, one gets the expression of the gradient. Okay? And now this gradient is a function of theta naught and theta 1. So depending on the values of theta naught and theta 1, I will get a different vector. And what this figure does for you is it shows you the vectors evaluated at different values of theta naught and theta 1. And it shows you that the gradients are always perpendicular to the contour plots. This is a theorem that's usually proven in multivariable calculus in second year. And it also shows that if you, all the arrows are pointing toward the maximum. If we had a ball instead of having it like um, a mountain, if we had it as a valley, if we flip it upside down, then the gradients would um, be pointing away from the, from the minimum. So if we go here, if we go in the direction of the gradient, we'll find the maximum. If we want to find the minimum, we just go in the opposite direction as the gradient. Okay. So that's basically all of optimization in, uh, with one very simple example. Um, of course, as we move on later, we're not going to have any more quadratic functions where it's guaranteed that you will find the optimal. But we will have functions where if you start going down from two points that are just a little bit apart, you might end up at different minima. And this will be the case with neural networks, where we're not longer going to have this property of having a single optimum, but we will have many optima. Um, but, but still, if we follow the gradients, we will get to a place that has lower cost. Okay. And learning is just about going to a place that has lower cost. We're not guaranteed always to find the optimal one, the best one. But the hope is that we will find one value of theta, of the theta vector, which will allow us to make reasonable predictions. We, and then we can test them with cross-validation and all the other techniques we've learned in the course. OK. So that's essentially um, what we're after. And I'm just going to introduce here a definition. Uh, the Hessian is going to be a, um, it's a generalization of the gradient. And it's defined essentially as the matrix of second derivatives. So if you can think of all the possible second derivatives you could take, and you were to place them inside a, a matrix, um, you would get uh, this uh, quantity, which we call um, the Hesse. So it's the derivative of a function with respect to each of the parameters twice in the diagonal. And then you get the cross derivatives of the diagonal. OK, so that's just a definition. And um, as I just pointed out, if we're doing um, offline learning, if we have a set of data, a batch of data, so we've seen n data, then in machine learning, typically the objective is to minimize um, an f of theta, which is uh, the sum of objective functions. And as an example of this, in least squares, we typically minimize this. So in least squares, f of theta and xi is just uh, quadratic uh, differences. 
now uh, the gradient is just um, the derivative of uh, of the function and so an important property is that gradients like derivatives because they are derivatives in fact they're still linear operators so if you have a the gradient of a sum is the sum of the gradients and so we can just take the gradient inside um, the sum when we're taking the gradient of f of theta. Okay, so um, if we have now linear regression, yi minus xi theta, which is just a generalization of this when theta is a larger vector. This Go is ahead. Small thing, but I didn't get why there was a one over n. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it seems like at the bottom there was a yeah. Thank you. Um, I forgot to mention that. Um, quite often we just have a 1 over n here to normalize. Um, now that 1 over n, it turns out, as you'll see soon when I introduce the algorithm, it's really not important because the algorithm will have a scale factor that will subsume the 1 over n. Uh, but I could quite easily put 1 over n here and that would not affect the answers we would find. That's just a scaling fact. Okay. When I discuss the algorithm, I'll, I'll bring this back. Okay, so, so we know that when we do least squares, we're just solving the, the sum of squared errors. Um, so we know what the objective function is, um, the gradient of f of theta. Uh, we can compute it, if you, we wish, uh, one by one, like I did here, one, one term at a time. Um, a faster way of doing it is just to comp use the rules of matrix differentiation. So in fact, we already did this, the derivative of this with respect to the vector many times uh, throughout the course, and we already know that this is just two x transpose x theta uh, minus 2x transpose y. Okay, we've done this many times. And uh, alternatively, you could get this from here, where you could just write the derivative grad theta of f of theta is equal to the sum over i of 2 times the quadratic xi, usually we have a transpose here, transpose theta, and then times the internal derivative, which is minus xi. And I think that to be correct, I would have, now that I've transposed, I need to move the xi elsewhere. So, let's put the minus here, and let's put the x, xi transpose here, okay? and the minus somehow disappeared as a minus here. Okay, so this is just the same expression. One is in matrix notation, one is in component-wise notation. But it's essentially um, these two expressions are the same. Um, so this is a way of checking that basically we're doing the right thing. We can either use sums or we can use matrix differentiation. Um, but now we can also compute the Hessian which is the second derivatives essentially, and we use this Greek symbol nabla to denote the gradient, and uh, if we differentiate the gradient, we get this thing called the Hessian. Um, so if we differentiate this again, we just get uh, 2x transpose x. So up to now we've not built an algorithm. All we've done is let's get what, what is the gradient and what is the Hessian for linear regression. 
I will then throughout this class will show you an algorithm that only uses the gradient in order to find theta and then we will discuss an algorithm that uses both the Hessian and the gradient to find theta and that algorithm is called Newton's method. We'll see that Newton method is so good that it only needs one step, one iteration to find the best solution. Whereas the gradient descent might require many steps and it's quite tricky to decide how many steps it will need. Oh yeah, thanks. All right. So the first algorithm is what we call the steepest descent. So you're on top of grouse, you're snowboarding, you turn around 360 degrees, you find a place where the slope is the steepest and you go in that direction. That's essentially the algorithm. Always follow the quick way, quickest way to get down to the minimum. And a uh, consequence of that is that if we're always following the steepest direction, if we have a function, say again, with two variables, theta naught and uh, theta one, then if we're going down, so you, we start somewhere in the function. At the bottom, I'm plotting the contour plots. And what we do is we just travel perpendicular to the contour plots. And if we go in a direction that's perpendicular to the contour plots, we will get to the center of this quadratic function. So in the function, what's happening is that we're going to the minimum. So we're just descending to find the minimum. And when you descend to find the minimum, you're just going perpendicularly to the contour plots. Um, in 2D, it's the same story. You can have a variable, a function that has two variables, theta naught and theta one. And what we do again is we start at some point and we go down to the minimum. And what we're doing there is we're just going perpendicularly to the contour uh, uh, plots. Oh wait, that's not what I started. Okay, so we're starting here, we're going perpendicular to the contour plots and we get to the minimum. Now, if I, on the other hand, start at a different location, let's say that I start at um, let's say that I start at this location, then as I go down, I will get to a different minimum. Okay. And then the way I go down, again, is I follow the gradient, that is, I go perpendicularly to the curves. So we start at any point, we follow the gradient, and we go to a minimum. In the quadratic case, which is least squares, there's only one minimum. And that's why there was only one single theta. There is only one theta that's the solution, which is x transpose x uh, inverse um, times x transpose y. So there's only one solution, and we find it. Um, but if we do neural networks, that will be the right-hand side. There will be many solutions, and all we'll be able to do is find one solution. And in order to know whether it's a good solution, we'll have to do cross-validation and many other tricks. But that's sort of the basic idea. Now, in math, what we're saying is that the new theta at iteration k plus 1 will be equal to the old theta. And because we're minimizing, we're going in the opposite direction as um, the gradients. The gradients point toward the maximum. So minus, and we're going to decide a step size. This step size, also known as um, the learning rate, think of it as how fast you're going, how much you trust the gradient. Okay, so you, if you're snowboarding, you can find the direction that is the steepest, and then you can still choose whether you're going to like go with both feet and just drag the snow down, or whether you're just going to put weight in your front foot and go for it. 
So you still choose the speed at which you go. Um, and so you choose a scalar amount of speed. Eta is a scalar. We, we choose eta by hand. And there are algorithms for choosing theta. But for now, let's assume the eta is a number that we will choose by hand. Like, I don't know, 2 or 0 0.1 or so. And then g is just a vector. Now, it's important to do dimension matching here. This is a d by 1 vector. This is also d by 1 vector. And the gradient is a d by 1 vector. Right? Just like here. You have a vector with two components, so d equal 2. The gradient has two components, d equal 2. So the dimensions match. And each, um, so essentially what we have is uh, d equations. And it makes sense that we have d equations because we need to, to update theta naught, and then we need to update theta 1 all the way up to theta d minus 1. So we update all the thetas. Go ahead. For, for a given eta, is this going <coughs> to converge for all values of eta, or just, like it's not obvious to me that this will necessarily converge for all values of eta. Um, that's correct. It's not obvious that it will converge at all, in fact. Yeah, in fact, it's so, not obvious um, that we're, we're going to go, uh, we're going to come to that issue. So how you choose the convergence of this algorithm will depend on the choice of eat, as we will soon see. But first, I kind of want you just to understand what the algorithm is. Um, you're at a single, you start at any random point. So when you code this, you just pick a random initial theta. And then you just keep updating theta using just that one single equation. So the algorithm requires that you compute the gradient. And also it requires that then you take a step in the direction of the grade. Evaluate the gradient step and so on. For the linear model, uh, we, we already know that the gradient of f of theta is equal to x transpose x theta plus sorry, minus 2x transpose y. And so the algorithm that you would construct would be theta k plus 1 is equal to theta k minus eta times the derivative x transpose x minus 2x <coughs> transpose y. Now, there is a 2, and that 2 disappeared. The reason why the 2 disappeared is because I can subsume the 2 in the eta. Eta is an arbitrary number, so I can put the 2 inside. There's no need to write the 2. And that is precisely also the same argument as why I don't write the n. Because I also subsume the n inside eta. Okay. And that's the algorithm. That would be how you would apply this for linear regression. Um, and so what, what is this actually doing? You can think of this as an iterative algorithm where if you have several points, what it is doing is it fits a line to the points at random. So you start with a guess. And then when you do an iteration, you find another line. And then you find another line and another line until you find a line that goes through the points. Okay, so in each update, you're finding a new value of theta naught and a new value of theta 1. And theta naught and theta 1 is all you need in order to get the line, right? Because the line is given by once you know its slope and once you know its intercept. And so what the algorithm is doing is just updating the lines as you go. 
Now, how fast, how big are the steps? Um, the size of the steps will depend on this parameter eta. As was pointed out, this parameter can determine convergence or not. If, let's look at two examples. Um, if you choose an eta that is too small, when you get to a region of the cost function that is fairly flat, you essentially will be moving, but you'll move, be moving very, very slowly. And it could take you, you know, you'll get to the minimum, but it will take you an infinite number of steps. So for any practical reasons, we would never attain the minimum. You would get stuck before you get to minimum. Okay? That's because our equation is theta k plus 1 is equal to theta k minus 0 0.1 times the gradient evaluated at theta k. Now, if, if this guy if this guy is small and this, you know, where the derivative becomes almost flat, you might be getting down to a function. You, know, you can have a function that is still minimizing, but there is a big region where the derivative is not flat, but it looks almost flat. So it's almost zero. And if it's almost zero, if you multiply it by a small number, you might get something here something that is approximately zero. And if it's approximately zero, it means that theta k plus one will be equal to theta k. You won't see any updates. So you observe what's in that plot. You observe that your theta updates are very tiny. And it's almost like the, in fact, once they get to underflow, you will not see any progress. The algorithm will stop. On the other hand, if you, if you take, um, something that's too large, so this would be too small. If you get something that's too large, it might oscillate. Okay, so if you, if you have a ball and you go too fast with your snowboard, you might overshoot the minimum. And then you're going to be doing this. You're going to be like a pendulum, up and down, up and down, up and down. And eventually you're going to get to the minimum, but it's going to take you quite a while. You'll be oscillating. Okay. So there is a choice of theta for which, a, a choice of eta that will give you just the right speed um, to get there. Now, eta is a tuning parameter. There are techniques for choosing eta. There's things called line search. I'm not going to go into that in this course. That's sort of outside this course, 540 or any course in optimization cover line search. Uh, which is just a way of testing the function to see how and readjusting your eta. So basically you take a few steps, if you don't see much of a change in the function height, you choose a bigger theta to take bigger steps. If you see huge changes, then that means you probably are oscillating, so you reduce the step size. What a lot of people do in practice with neural networks is they just choose those by hand. And sometimes they choose an eta that's of the form 1 over n. So we bring back this 1 over n. Because that basically means that you do big updates in the beginning, and then as time goes by, your updates become smaller and smaller. Um, so in the last slide where you mentioned this algorithm, in previous, previous to previous, uh, you had used eta k. I'm wondering if eta is a constant or... Sorry, which slide? The one before this one. Victor. This slide. Yeah. So, eta k, I mean, it's not a constant, so it changes? It may be a constant, like two, you can choose it. Or as I said just now, you can also choose one over the number of steps. So you could choose one over k. Okay, so, so this is going to be a design. So, it so change at every step. That's, I mean, yes, that's steps. correct. So if you do this technique called line search, which we're not going to cover in this course, but which I just gave you the intuition that if there's no much change in the height, you increase eta. And if there's big changes in the height, you decrease eta. Um, if you do that, then you can see that eta is a function of time, oh. of k. But in this course, Let's assume that eta is a constant, say 
a number like 0 0.1 or 0 0.6. And then it's up to you to choose the right value of that E2. I know you're all smart. You can all go and implement line search because it's actually a smarter way of doing it. But I will leave that to you. I'm not going to cover it. OK, so Newton's method um, will, however, address uh, this problem, which will, will give us a way of basically automatically choose the learning rate. But it's not just going to choose the learning rate as a scalar, but it will choose it as a matrix, because there's going to be learning rates along all possible directions, if you will. Um, the catch of Newton's method is that it requires a matrix of derivatives. If you happen to have two parameters, your vector gradient has two entries, and your Hessian has four entries because the Hessian then requires the derivatives with respect to theta naught theta 1 and theta 1 theta naught and then theta 2 squared and th sorry theta 1 squared and then theta 1 squared. So you have uh, four terms for the Hessian. Now if you have many uh, parameters like for example in the, twi in, uh, in the Twitter classification example that you guys have to implement, if you were to try linear regression there and you have I don't know, a thousand parameters or a million parameters often, then your gradient vector with a million parameters would be of size a million. Your Hessian would be of size a million by a million. So that would be a lot of storage. So Newton's method will turn out to be much faster and it, it gets rid of this issue of having to choose the step size, but you pay for it and you pay for it in storage. So there's a trade-off. There is no free lunch here. OK, so Newton's method chooses as the step size uh, the inverse of the Hessian at iteration k. And we can derive this algorithm if we think of a Taylor series approximation. Now, uh, Taylor series approximation just means expand the function um, in terms of, uh, how many of you have seen Taylor series approximations? Let's see, okay, most of you. Uh, Taylor series approximations where it's on the screen. Uh, a Taylor approximation about, oops, sorry about that. A Taylor uh, series approximation of f of theta is an approximation up to some degree, in this case we're gonna go to degree two, of the function evaluated at a point times the derivative and then the interval theta minus theta k um, and then the quadratic term involving the second derivatives. Okay, so it's just an expansion of a function in terms of its derivatives. Um, one way to think of it is, um, think of this as the, oops, this should be theta. Sorry about that. Think of this case here where we have the function f of theta, then the quadratic Taylor series approximation. It's just a quadratic function that near the value of theta k provides a very good fit. And away from it, the fit deteriorates. But at theta k, the two functions are tangent to each other. In particular, at theta k, you ensure that this function, these functions have the same slope and the same curvature. And that's basically what a second order expansion is. And so we created this quadratic function to have the same slope and the same surface. If we differentiate it, <coughs> with respect to theta, we will get zero because theta k is a, a specific value of theta. And then we will get the gradient <coughs> and then we will get um, h k theta.
Now, if we now equate this um, HK theta, oh, hang on, let me expand this HK theta. minus theta k. <coughs> okay. <coughs> and essentially this term here is theta, if we, if we transpose h, theta k uh, minus 2 uh, hang on, let me be careful here, take my steps. So what I've done is I just expanded um, this term here, which is just this guy here, which is just a half, and then I would have had theta hk theta, and then I would have had minus 2 theta transpose hk theta k, and then I would have had plus theta k hk theta k. Okay. And if I take the derivative of all these terms, the derivative of this guy will be zero with respect to theta. I just get um, the expression that I have at the bottom. And so if I equate this to zero, I get um, gk minus gk is equal to hk theta minus um, hk theta k and then minus h k minus 1 times g k is equal to theta minus theta k from where the Newton algorithm step above um, comes. Okay, so that's essentially how you would derive it. So the Newton algorithm, what it's doing is it's finding the next theta k as the minimum of the quadratic function. We don't know how to minimize the function, so what we do is we approximate it. At theta k, we approximate it with a quadratic function, the blue line. That quadratic function has the same slope and the same curvature at that point. We go down that quadratic function all the way to find its minimum. And that's then our value of theta k plus 1. And then we repeat it. We again fit the quadratic and we follow it to a minimum. And, and so now we're trying, we're essentially using a, an idea which is since we can't optimize the original function, we optimize the function that we know how to optimize, which is a quadratic. Okay. So, very quickly, I started the class late, so I'm just going to take a couple more minutes to finish. Um, the gradient is 2x transpose x theta minus x transpose y. Um, the Hessian, and that's what I'm calling g, the Hessian is just equal to 2x transpose x. Now, if we do the um, update for linear regression, we would have theta k plus 1 is equal to theta k 